Me and Megan, we when we we were working with each other start of summer last year, I think. Yeah, I think it was June. Yeah, yeah, and actually, we first, I mean, we got in touch when you were just thinking about working with someone in LA that dealt with metaphobia, right? Because we never spoke about that actually. Yeah, yeah, I was. I've been searching basically my whole life. <laughs> um, so when I found him, he was like the only one in LA that knew even about emetophobia. And he had a six month waiting list. So yeah, I yeah, yeah. was on his waiting list when you and I got in contact. Yeah, because I remember, I mean, we had our initial consultation, you were in your car about to do a <laughs> yoga lesson or something i think <laughs> a dance yeah. class yeah yeah no that was it yeah i got great memory um <laughs> and yeah no, i remember you saying that you had you you were on a list with someone in la waiting to get started but you thought hey why don't we give this a go whilst i'm waiting anyway and if it works great if not then i got something else lined up yeah and um, he ended up calling me like uh three months later and i was like nope i'm all good i don't need you <laughs> <laughs> good Good, fantastic. Um, so, what I want to do, especially at the start of this podcast for everyone, because for anyone that hasn't gone through this program, this process before, we don't spend that much time talking about the past, because when it comes to getting someone over their emetophobia, it's uh, the the process is not like psychotherapy. If you go and see a, you go and see a therapist, you're going to spend a lot of time talking about what's gone on in your life, trauma, mm -hmm. trying to get to the bottom of it and work through that in order to get you over it. Mm -hmm. The approach on this end is slightly different. It's a very active process of what you keep doing every day to maintain this phobia. So I kind of, I mean, I don't really know much about <laughs> what it was like for Megan to grow up and live with a metaphobia. So, yeah, you know, you get to learn. You, when did you think that you became Emetophobic. When did you first start noticing that there was something going on there? Um, I started noticing it when I was 11. And of course, I um, attributed it to a traumatic event in my life. My grandmother had just passed. Um, I'm seeing my mom, you know, for the first time in my life be like super vulnerable and, um, you know, not, not superwoman. And I was on a school bus and I had a panic attack. I didn't know then that it was a panic attack, but, um, you know, I thought I was going to be sick and the bus driver was really horrible to me. And she was like, here's some napkins, go to the back of the bus. I'm not stopping. I'm not pulling over. Um, and then from that day forward, I was like, well, this must be like a really horrible thing. Um, mm -hmm. so, and then I just started from there. Mm, yeah, yeah. I think a, a lot of emetophobes do have a moment in their past that was particularly unpleasant for me. It was similar to yours in an educational setting um, where I had a girl that was ill in the class um, and it took me by surprise and I realized that that was to me, absolutely terrifying. Um, but also just for reference for a lot of people that are listening to this, about half of my clients don't have a crux, a moment in their past where they kind of, that light bulb, I'm a metaphobic, it just started because you don't need one in order to create a metaphobia. It helps in the formation of a set of limiting beliefs about it um, in the same way it's easier to form the happy positive beliefs about the summer when you live in sunny California like you do mm -hmm. in comparison to forming less helpful beliefs about the winter if you live somewhere like Norway where it's not particularly sunny on a regular basis right. but it's not the be all end all um, as you understand as you go further through the process so when you were growing up with a metaphobia can you remember what kind of things it stopped you from doing? How did it impact your life when you were when you were younger, kind of a kid or as a teenager or in <laughs> school and college and stuff like that? Yeah, so um, in fifth grade, right after that incident happened, um, I 
kind of refused to go to school. Uh, my mom would have to like drag me kicking and screaming. Um, I was so afraid that I either I was going to be sick or someone around me would be sick in school. Um, just that anything where I had to be closed in and I couldn't leave on my own will um, was really terrifying for me. So that was like all public transportation. Um, what else? Like I couldn't. I would. I didn't eat meat for like ten years because I was convinced that I was going to get sick from that. Um, and then as a teenager, it was weird because, you know, I was trying to be social and I was trying to, like, I considered myself a very social person and I would go out a lot and I would go to dance clubs. And the second I started to panic or feel like I might be sick, I would leave without telling my friends and they'd be like Mm -hmm. dancing and then looking around and they can't find me. And I'm like halfway home driving in my car because, Mm -hmm. um, for me, my car was my safe place. And I felt like as long as I was there and no one was around me, I could, if I was going to be sick, then it wouldn't be as traumatic or embarrassing. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but my life was really strategically planned around being sick. Um, Anything I was invited to, it was like, okay, like, who's going to be there? When can I leave? You know, where are my exits? Do I have my own car? I I always insisted on driving. Um, Mm. I couldn't be in the car with other people. Um, I couldn't be driven by somebody else. I usually had to drive the car myself. And then I had a very small radius of, like, my comfort zone, like, where I would feel comfortable, like, knowing that I could get to a safe space within 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I couldn't really go beyond, um, yeah, that little safe space that I created for myself. Mm. And all of those things have one thing in common, which is trying to feel more in control, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, every, every emetophobe is listening to this will be relating it to so many different corners of their life. You know, when you're talking about getting yourself home from the club, it instantly reminds me of the time that I was standing on the corner of a, um, a pavement in a place called Guildford, which is near where I live in the UK. And um, all of my friends were sorting out the Uber and it was kind of about 3 a.m. in the morning and they were all hammered. And I was trying to will myself to stick around and get in the Uber with them and without saying anything to anyone like you did, I just took off, I just turned around walked off. I remember walking up this big hill um, to, you know, because I was embarrassed. Mm -hmm. I was embarrassed that I wasn't able to go and do what all of my friends were doing Mm -hmm. and they were expecting me to get in the Uber with them. And I was, you know, panicking Mm -hmm. and I didn't believe that I could. So, And it's so hard to explain. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm sure your friends are as great as mine. Like, I had the best Mm -hmm. friends who are super loving and super understanding. But when it comes to this, they just they'd never understood. So, and how could they, if they haven't been in our shoes, but, um, yeah, there's a certain amount of embarrassment that comes with it because it sounds crazy, you know? And they're like, but it's what, what just get in the car. You're fine. And I'm like, no, Mm -hmm. I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. It's just being sick, Megan, you know, you're going to be okay. You know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Which, um, and I get it. I, I, I understand why to people that don't have a metaphobia, they see it like that, because obviously in reality, they can see that being sick is unpleasant, right? Right. What they're not experiencing, because the way they think about it is so different to us, is they're not experiencing the kind of emotions that you or I or anyone else that has a metaphobia is experiencing in that moment, which is terrifying right that fear is so great it's the kind of fear that you would expect to feel if you were faced with a polar bear right you're going to be absolutely terrified Um, but to someone it's trying to contextualize you fear that much fear that you know your life is in danger kind of threat level around sick and it's like oh i don't get it i don't understand right? right and it doesn't mean they're bad friends it no. just means that they, they can't get their head around it. Yeah. Um, so hence, there is so much social anxiety about emetophobia. And that's why when I bring it up with people that don't have it, and I say, well, actually, according to research, one in 10 people have emetophobia, 
they go, oh, there's no way, you know, there's no way one in 10 people, I would know someone if that was the case. Right. And I say, you probably do. Probably it's do. just, you don't realize because yes. they hide it. And, you know, we do a pretty good job at hiding the fact that we have a metaphobia. Yes. I would think like maybe my parents and three of my closest friends knew, you know, mm. my entire life. So. Yeah. 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 I think probably similar. And if I was speaking about what I was struggling with or behaving in a way that was a uh, an end product of the anxiety I was experiencing, I would put it down to things that I you know, it's just generalized anxiety. Mm -hmm. I it on a podcast, if I was telling people about flying, it was, oh, well, I've got a fear of flying. Mm -hmm. um, because to me, that sounded less weird at the time than, well, I'm just terrified that someone's going to be sick and I can't get off the plane. Yep. Uh, but of course, now me and you not having metaphobia, with the, the hindsight, the empathy towards it, it's not weird. There's nothing weird about having a metaphobia, especially when you understand how and why it exists. Right. So, I know when yeah. you told me how many people had it, cause I had no idea. I mm. didn't believe you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I had to do some research. Um, and I was just like, yeah, how come I don't know anyone like this? So there was mm. so much comfort in, in meeting you and you know, you're the first person I've ever talked to that, mm. um, had a metaphobia. So mm. that, so, on that note, yeah. question for you then. Other than the guy that you'd got in touch with in LA, mm -hmm. had you had you reached out to anyone ever for help with a metaphobia? Oh before? yeah. Yes. Yeah. A ton. Okay. Um I think I started therapy when I was sixteen. Mm -hmm. Um and I was diagnosed with general anxiety disorder, panic disorder. Um, everything under the sun, <laughs> but yeah. never emetophobia. And when I would talk to, I think like in the very beginning, I didn't really, like, I felt like general anxiety, I guess. Um, but then I thought, you know, my fear of being sick was completely separate. I didn't think of those two things as being the same because the therapists were always like, no, you just have generalized anxiety or panic disorder. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started kind of putting two and two together and I'm like, well, it's actually like I panic because I f am afraid of being ill or I'm afraid of someone being ill around me. Or um, when I am trapped in a situation where someone could be ill, that is when I feel the most anxious. And I think I probably went through like, 10 different therapists through a period of time and none of them understood that they just thought mm. no this is we're going to treat you for general anxiety we're going to put you on medication um and yeah no one had yeah. ever really heard of it so mm. I kind of yeah. gave up for a long time because that was when I was really young and then I gave up you know trying to find someone and I think when it got really bad again was when I was you know wanting to become a mother and I was like okay I I got to get over my fear first because I can't become a mother like this and that's when I really started searching again and then found out all this information that there's so much like research that's been done since and there's all these you know people who know about it can you remember how you came across me yeah um I think I think you added me on Instagram mm -hmm. and then I was like, thanks for the ad. I'm yeah. yeah I've been looking yeah. at, at the emetophobia free Instagram account because I was like, wow, there's all these people that have it. And, and weirdly I bought the, um, the manual. I bought it on like my Kindle or something, um, in, 2017 and I couldn't get past the part where you're supposed to sign your name mm. I was like no like that's yeah. too cheesy I'm like I'm out <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I was like um I just kind of put it aside and forgot about it and then when I found you guys on Instagram I was like this is that manual that I never actually read so obviously I read it the second time yeah yeah mm -hmm. well <laughs> you know, that's that's 
a massive factor, and I've spoken about it quite a lot, that so many emetophobes do buy that manual and it sits on their shelf collecting lots of dust because the idea of committing to something like that, it feels like a lot because living with emetophobia for any emetophobe usually is the worst part of their entire life and this feels like it's it, right? Right. Um, and so why would you, you know, want to spend time with it if you know you can just push it aside and pretend like it doesn't exist when yeah. you're having mm -hmm. those good moments and you're not yeah. you know having anxious thoughts you don't mm -hmm. want to like mm -hmm. dive into it but yeah. if you really want to change then you do <laughs> mm -hmm. well yeah and unfortunately desperation as in when you end up having a really difficult moment or blip in time desperation tends to be the biggest motivator it was always why i came back to thinking about doing the manual when i was younger um because yeah you know emetophobia is not always as debilitating as it is at times and sometimes you get to live a life that is kind of predictable and straightforward and you're not feeling nauseous all the time and you're not worried about everything because it's middle of summer and it's not norovirus season and mm -hmm. there's no one coming home saying their tummy aches or whatever it is and it's easier to cruise and then of course something does inevitably happen and you get desperate to do something about it but that whole cycle would be preventable if you pick it up and I think for a lot of people why they don't is that fear of failing mm -hmm. but of course you can't fail going through this right you can stop yeah you can read halfway through it and put it down and not do any more right. but you can't fail going through the program because you just got to pick it back up and keep moving mm -hmm. with it, and you will eventually get there. Yeah. Um, did you? Um, I'm I'm assuming the answer is obvious, but when you would go and seek out people to help you to overcome it in the past, and you would sit down and you would have the consultation with you and them, and they would let you know that they're not that sure what emetophobia is or you have to explain it to them or they do tell you they know what it is but then they start diving into areas that have nothing to do with emetophobia mm -hmm. would you feel pretty quickly quite disheartened oh yeah absolutely i just felt like oh i'm the crazy one like i'm the only one who has this no they've never even heard of it before um which is crazy to think now because there's so many people that know about it. But, um, yeah, no, I would be completely disheartened. And I think that's why I changed therapists so much because I was just like, what's the point? Like, I'm sitting here being treated for general anxiety and doing breathing techniques and doing, you know, all these things that were not helping. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I was very discouraged and felt very isolated because I was like, mm -hmm. I'm literally the only person on this earth with this fear and yep. yeah. That's, that's why, and I quite often say this, when I sit down and have a consultation, a discovery call with someone, it tends to be one of my favorite calls of the whole process because you get someone that is in a position like you and where I was, where you've gone and seen so many people in the past that have had no idea or have never said anything even remotely relatable to what you're going through right and then by the end of that half an hour call it's quite often nicely met with you know god i've never spoken to someone that actually gets it before mm -hmm. and actually understands and that's you know that's a really liberating feeling to mm -hmm. experience i remember when i was going through the process um i couldn't stop sort of laughing to myself because my coach would say something really like he was reading my mind <laughs> kind of and I was like, oh, my God, you know, how do you know that about me? How do you know that I right. double check before I make my cup of tea or the label on the back of the milk carton <laughs> and stuff like that? And I'm like, how do you know this? You know, I thought it was only me. And it is. It's such a nice, comforting feeling mm -hmm. to know that you're not crazy. Yes. I think I started listening to this podcast um, and you and Rob were talking about, you know, people who had it and explaining situations and I was like I'd be like in the opposite room from my husband and I'd 
stop everything, I'd press pause and I'd be like, run and take the phone into like his office and say, listen, listen, this is just like me. There's other people like me. And I was having like these revelations every day and mm. he'd be like, whoa, I didn't know that, you know, other people had it either. So mm. it was really, yeah, the podcast helped so much just to Good. hear you and Rob discuss everything. But um, yeah, I definitely felt less alone and I felt like, how do they know that? How is this person just like me? And, it was, now I want to like meet everyone who has a metaphobia because yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'd all well, have I such an amazing that. conversation. <laughs> yeah, that is why I love doing what I do because I get yeah. to meet so many. I see about four different versions of you and I on a daily basis and it's yeah. great because we all live totally different lives, but there are so many similarities, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. um, between person to person and seeing someone go from believing they're going to be stuck like this for their whole lives and feeling broken, right. like they can't be fixed, to getting to sit where you are today. It's, from my perspective, it's very, very rewarding. I know. Um, I, I envy what you do. And if I had mm -hmm. the time, I would be doing it too. But yeah. I'm yeah, still I'm, maybe, yeah. still maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, nicely brings us on to the actual process itself of going through this. Um, and I think... A lot of people, I mean, the testimonials are fantastic because it's that real, you look at it and you see somebody that is saying that they're over this phobia, right? Mm -hmm. But they are warm and glowy for a reason because someone's very, very proud of how far they've come and they've mm -hmm. got over this phobia. But I also think that it's important to acknowledge going through this process, it isn't always sunshine and rainbows. Right. It's not thriving. It's never looked like this of just onwards and upwards every single day and never having a difficult moment no. it is it's a bit of an up and down but eventually obviously getting across the finishing line in the end um but for you did you find that that was the case that it was a little bit up and down um i felt for me yes in the very beginning and then i mm -hmm. felt like things started consistently just trending upward Mm. And um, I think by the time I got to the end, like the last chapter, which I think is like the dream technique or something, I was so over my fear already that I was like, I don't even need this dream stuff. Like, mm. I, I mean, I did read it and I and I still use it today. But at that point, I was like, oh, I'm good. I mm. read it. Um, mm. So for me, there was ups and downs. They were little, but the, I think... You know, I was constantly coming to you with like huge wins and yeah. I was just shocked all the time at mm -hmm. how steadily I was increasing. Yeah. My yeah. Well, you had some really big ones um, yeah. and there were quite a few things that were thrown into your path that not many people have to deal with, like the guy that got unwell at the restaurant um did he, he he was actually you know he had a was it a seizure or something like that uh yeah i think it was a seizure um yeah, yeah and he was ill do you want me to tell the story or <laughs> i don't know yeah I, yeah I mean you can tell it to me to 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 the point of obviously there are a lot of people that are listening that don't want to hear the the graphics of it right but um yeah to, to an extent more what you were proud of yourself for for how you were dealing with it yeah well um you know, there was this older man who was sick in a restaurant and um, let's just say like if that would have happened a month prior, I mm. would have got up from the table, left my friends there, left them with the check and said like, I'll sell you later or something like that and been in my car and driving home. Like I would want nothing to do with even being in the restaurant, being in the vicinity or like, mm -hmm. um, I would be in full panic mode. Um, so the fact that this happened while I was going through the Thrive program, I was kind of like, who put this here? <laughs> like who planned this? <laughs> um, yeah. But so he, yeah, he was ill and instead of running away I actually ran towards him I didn't just tolerate it I just I wasn't just like sitting in my seat and then looking at him and going oh that's unpleasant like whatever I'm gonna finish my meal I saw that he needed help and um, that his wife needed assistance in helping him so 
I ran towards him and I was just like, what can I do? What can I do? And everyone was like, you know, get some stuff to clean up. And I was like, just in there. And I was like, mm -hmm. the whole time, I just kept thinking like, who am I? Like, how is this happening? Like how I, sh I shouldn't be helping. <laughs> I should be running. But I didn't feel like I had, I felt, I think what the Thrive Program did for me was, um, it made me feel so powerful around these situations that I sought them out sometimes. Or I like, you know, I, when I was looking to, to try to like, I don't want to say, well, okay, I was watching movies to try to like mm -hmm. make myself okay with. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and it got to a point where I was like, bring it on, bring it on, bring it on more and more and more. And so, yeah. So I think that was happening, what was happening there too. I was just kind of like, I want to dive in as much as I can. I want to completely immerse myself. I want to. Mm. And I had been against exposure therapy for my entire life. So mm. I don't even know what happened that made me want mm. to like jump in. And mm. Well, I do. It, and I can break it down. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the reason why... Uh, exposure therapy, especially in the world of, uh, of metaphobia, can be problematic is you lack the necessary beliefs in your ability to regulate your emotions at the time, right? And that's one of the biggest parts of a metaphobia is that when you are faced with something similar, be it in a film, be it in real life, you don't feel like you can regulate the, the really intense emotions you're experiencing, like fear, right? Mm -hmm. And as you start to build that skill set up by going through the program, it's natural that you want to start kind of exploring it. It's sort of a curiosity of, yeah, how far can I start to push myself mm -hmm. and to see what I can do? And it's really rewarding, right? It really mm -hmm. is. Um, and, you know, that's also a part of what I try and explain to people when they're sitting down for the first time is that I never, and you can attest to it, I would never, I've never asked you to go and expose yourself to sick i would never ask you to go out of your way to drop all your safety seeking behaviors or anything like that because mm -hmm. there's no point right? right there's no point because as you start to build that skill set up internally mm -hmm. it just starts to disappear mm -hmm. on its own right without any real attention and you start finding yourself in situations like that or actively seeking it out to prove that i can mm -hmm. and i've got it and that's such a thrilling feeling it mm -hmm. really is it's like um what can i compare that to i suppose it's like as you're getting physically fitter and you start to do things run further cycle faster whatever it is and mm -hmm. you start realizing just what you're capable of and then you start wanting to push yourself even harder to see what you've got in the tank it's yeah. just yours as a as a mental tank yeah, I yeah. think you had mentioned, or maybe I heard this in the pod podcast about Rob, who was like, you know, trying to like thrive in every way possible. So he was like, bring it on, like, like the hardest things. He's like, I just want to see if I can thrive through it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think, mm -hmm. yeah, that's how I feel today. Like I mm. told you the other day that I just went to go see um, the zone of interest in the movie theater and there's a scene where, you know, he's ill and I was like so excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is yeah. so yeah. strange, but like yeah. I get excited mm -hmm. when I can mm -hmm. handle it and when I'm like, yeah. oh, that does nothing to me. It feels, it, yeah, it's a great yeah. feeling. Well, it's, it, yeah, the best way to describe it is liberating because yeah. it's been such a debilitating part of your life for so long those constant oh my god i'm just not that person anymore yeah is um yeah i fyi the shine does start to wear off after a while i don't really do that so much anymore but <laughs> when i you know was fairly freshly over my emetophobia mm -hmm. you do um you do keep having those moments of oh my god look what i'm doing this is so amazing kind mm -hmm. of thing um i went and worked uh, before i came to do what i do now as a um a beach lifeguard Mm. And we would get like 6,000 people down there every day. So I was always dealing with ill people or oh, injured wow. people and stuff like that. And all of these kind of situations where when I had my emetophobia would have been the worst possible yeah, scenario. <laughs> yeah. 
but that whole summer that I was working on that beach, um, it was constantly full of those kinds of like liberating. Oh my God, look what I'm doing. And I'm actually so calm. And this is kind of exciting. And it sort of feels weird because, you know, it is sort of dealing with someone that is sick, but mm-hmm. it, at the same time, it's that you're just a, like a kid coming home from school that's all proud of their art project <laughs> and wants mum to stick it up on the fridge. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. And I you think. should be proud because you did yes. put in the hard work. Yes, definitely. So going through the program, it's and it's quite difficult sometimes for an emetophobe to understand because although the end goal is overcoming your emetophobia, and we do talk about emetophobia, the actual emetophobia itself is a byproduct of not thriving, mm-hmm. right? If you had learned growing up how to thrive, how to feel internally capable at managing the unpleasant emotions you experience, to build your self-esteem up Mm -hmm. so that you really like who Megan is and all of these corners of someone that has a thriving mental health, it's impossible to form a load of limiting beliefs like emetophobia, right? So a lot of the focus is about getting you as thriving as possible. So, I mean, question for you, what's kind of been the biggest change that you've seen in relation to your thriving mental health nowadays or quality of life that isn't so much to do with emetophobia? Wow. Um, Gosh, it spans over everything because um, like we know that emetophobia you know, stems from a lot of things, but for me, it was mainly, you know, an external locus of control that I had that um, needed to be more internal so that I felt powerful in situations to cope with um, emotions and cope with negative thoughts and feelings. So um, it it's changed my life in every way. Like there's things that weren't related to emetophobia that I still had fears of. Um, Mm -hmm. Anything that would be publicly embarrassing or um, medical, I was like very scared of like, I had medical anxiety. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't have any of that anymore. So it's Mm -hmm. helped in those ways too. So um, like I used to be afraid that, you know, if I watched a crazy, you know, flashy movie in the movie theater that I would have, you know, a seizure. Um, I would, you know, my husband is a musician and I go to crazy concerts all the time with flashing lights and I would always close my eyes because I was like, I don't want to, you know, have a seizure in front of everybody here. Um, Now I keep my eyes wide open. I like enjoy the flashing lights. I enjoy, um, like a lot of stimulation because I can, I know that I can handle it now. Um, that, and just every, I, I use the Thrive program in every way, it, you know, when it doesn't have to do with being sick at all. Um, mm-hmm. And my mm-hmm. husband is great. He's always like, he's like, use your Thrive program, <laughs> you know, like, and I'm able to like tap in and, you know, um, it's really just for me about being in control internally so that Mm -hmm. externally anything could happen around me that I'm not in control of and Mm -hmm. I'll still be okay and I will cope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a good example, right, that I remember seeing from you is your recent getaway to the mountains, being able to enjoy that, that would have previously been too much, too difficult, right? Too difficult, yeah. I, Mm -hmm. I... avoided the mountains for a long time because the roads are windy and they often would create, you know, motion sickness. Mm. Um, and then when I got there, I would experience altitude sickness, which mm. I don't know if it was psychosomatic or if that was real. Um, but yeah, we are buying a house in the mountains now. So I'm going to be going often and I've been going often and we've been doing the drive and it's, hasn't affected me at all and neither has the altitude sickness so amazing fantastic so question for you then going through all of this can you remember what your your biggest win was what you were most 
proud of yourself for? Was there a moment where you remember sitting back and just sort of feeling on cloud nine and just so happy with everything that Megan had done? Man, um, gosh, there were so many. And this is going to sound really, really strange because it's such a little, a little thing. Um, I would say, you know, what we discussed earlier with the, the man being ill, I think that was probably my proudest moment because I was able to help someone. And um, I think that's, you know, something I value of, in myself. Mm -hmm. But um, there was a moment I had when I was um, in the back of a car, which I would never have normally sat in the back of a car. Um, and, you know, I live in the hills and someone else was driving that I'm not close with. Um, they were driving the windy roads and I was on my phone and I was like getting work done, like texting on my phone. And I didn't even realize, like, I just kept thinking like, gosh, I have so much time in the car today. I wonder why. <laughs> and then I realized that I was like on my phone texting in windy roads. And I was like, what? Like, I'm not scared of this. Like, I just started doing it without thinking. And it's so weird that we, not weird, because I know that we are putting in the work, but like you put in all this hard work and you think that maybe it doesn't have anything to do with emetophobia. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you're doing something that you've never done before. And you're like, wait, where'd this skill come from? You know, like, yep. mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so that was like a really big wow moment for me. Um, to be texting, to be looking down, like yep. in a windy mm -hmm. road mm -hmm. as a passenger in the back seat yep. of a car. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, and mm -hmm. after that, I did that, I started just going on all these rides at Universal Studios. Um, mm. And there's one specific ride there that um, makes everyone very sick. Yeah, They even have a little room for you to be sick in after. Um, yeah. And I avoided it my whole life. But I went on it. And I was just like, if I get sick, I get sick. I, I mm -hmm. guess I'm just not afraid of it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, which, uh, you know, it's a really good point, actually, is what you uh, bring that up, because um, I've, since I've overcome my metaphobia, I've still never been to a, a theme park, just because there's none near me, mm -hmm. uh, and the nearest one's about, it's, it's a long way away, um, but although I've never directly challenged myself at a theme park, and when I had a metaphobia, you couldn't have paid me enough to, you know, send me over there, I, would, I would just wouldn't have done it, I would have outright refused, right? Mm -hmm. But I know for an absolute fact that if you said, right, Joe, we're going tomorrow, I would go and I'd enjoy it, I'd mm -hmm. have fun, right? Because what that is, is it's your, your overarching sense of feeling powerful and in control, right? And when that's there, you, as you, as you pointed out, you catch yourself doing things without even realizing, because you don't create the anxiety about it beforehand, mm -hmm. it doesn't consciously cross your mind that that is something that you would have previously have panicked about right. until you kind of have that light bulb moment when you're halfway through and you go, oh my God, look what I'm doing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the, it, it's, you don't have to challenge every single corner of your life that's ever been limiting in relation to a metaphobia in order to overcome it. When you right. believe that you can cope, when you possess the internal skill set, everything that was a problem just melts away yeah. on its own. So, yeah. So, and we've, I mean, we've sort of covered it, but as a whole, what does your life look like now that you don't have a metaphobia as a member of your family and being able to do what you want to do holidays travel work food yeah i do everything now i don't have any um limiting behaviors i don't have i don't even think about emetophobia really anymore um i think if i do it's like a, a habitual thought will pop up and then i'm like oh wait that's the old me or like, that, mm -hmm. like it doesn't mm -hmm. affect me anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't have any limitations. Um, I'm going um, March 8th on my first 
flight in 20 years. Um, I have a ticket. So I'm excited to do that, to add that to my list of challenges. Um, Just excited to be traveling again. And yeah, I'm just in control of every, every aspect of my life. So it's just, I don't know, it's gotten, everything's gotten better, which is crazy to say. I know that like, I've listened to these podcasts and I've felt like it was hard to believe when I heard other people say these things. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is true. It's like it, it helps in every area of your life. And yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a stronger step parent to my stepson and, um, you know, a better wife, better friend, um, less flaky friend, obviously. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I bet. I bet. I'm not afraid to go places and make up excuses for why I can't go. So yeah, I don't know. It's just, it does, it feels like thriving and it feels like the program is appropriately named because that's what happens as you thrive. Perfect. It's a perfect synopsis. <laughs> of it all. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I do want to touch that it's life without a metaphobia is so much rosier that there are so many things that you never thought you wanted to do that all of a sudden you decided actually you do want to do but right and this is a point that i like to put across to to my clients is although i do this job right and my position is to help people to gain a thriving mental health that's what the thrive program is all about right Mm -hmm. but thriving it isn't about being this robot that never experiences unpleasant emotions ever right that's unrealistic you know i'm still gonna get moody if someone's eaten my cereal in the morning and i was really looking forward to it Mm -hmm. right it's just you know and on a bigger level than that right but you have the skills to get through difficult days when they do come along because life is full of them um and thriving is feeling like you can face those adversities head on without worrying about what you're going to do or looking for the nearest person to hold your hand through it or external aid to cope and mm-hmm. to get through it. So Yeah, absolutely. And like you said about, um, you know, like just like the perspective of life is different. I can say that when I was finishing the program, I could have sworn to anyone that the world actually looked brighter, like Mm. physically, Mm -hmm. like colors Mm -hmm. were more vibrant. And um, I think because there wasn't a huge part of my brain that was being occupied by negative thoughts, whether they were subconscious or conscious, um, that I was now seeing things that I'd never seen before. And I'm like, oh, there's like that tree. Or like, I was just more aware of my surroundings and like, the world actually seemed brighter, which is sounds mm-hmm. so corny to say, but mm-hmm. it did get brighter. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. Good. Wonderful. Well, is there anything that you want to add or to talk about? Because it's been really nice on my end. As I say, a lot of these things, these kind of conversations, we're actually having them for the first time yeah. because the, the process isn't so much about what it's actually or what it was like to live with a metaphobia. It's about focusing on what you need to do to get yourself over it. Mm -hmm. Um, And putting that all into practice has been, thank you, so lovely for me Mm -hmm. to be able to actually hear about all of these things. But yeah, is there anything that you want to to talk about or ask before we finish this up? Um, I think I just want, um, I want people to take away from this Um, if they're listening, (laughs) to know that it works. I think the skepticism um, for me was like a a big turnoff in the beginning. You know, I think Mm -hmm. I like read comments that was like, is this an MLM or is this, uh, you know, I don't know, things that I guess you might be skeptic of if you don't know anything about it. Um, But... I just wanted to come on here and just try to be as real as possible because I Mm -hmm. feel like sometimes, you know, in the Thrive Manual, there is a lot of vocabulary and we use that vocabulary Mm -hmm. often and it's important, but it can kind of make it sound a little mechanical or 
um, you know, planned. So I wanted people to know that like when they hear that, when they hear the terms being used, it's not because it's like a cult <laughs> or anything, yeah. but that it's like, you know, that it, it's something real and it actually works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I definitely, definitely agree. Um, and again, understandable why so many people have the thought that it, it doesn't work because mm -hmm. they've gone and seen so many people and they are still stuck with it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's about diving in and trying not to see it as I've got to do it perfectly because otherwise I'm going to be stuck like this forever because yeah. it's not the case. Yeah, it really isn't. Wonderful. Thank you, Megan. Thank you so much for coming on here. And, you know, it's it's not the easiest thing to do to no. just do another podcast. There. I mean, neither am I, right? I'm a mental health coach. So, it you know, it takes some bravery to sit here and lay yourself bare to people listening about what it's like. Um, but I'm sure there are so many people that really appreciate it and can relate to everything that you said about it. So okay. thank you. I hope so. I'm always um, on your Instagram, like, People will message me often because I'll leave a comment for you, and which is really weird because I am not on Instagram. I'm not like active on Instagram mm. Mm. in any other capacity, but with um, your account and with the Emetophobia Free account. And people will write to me all the time on there, like DM me and ask, "Does this really work, or is this fake, or what? What should I do?" And I've made so many friends. Like I. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, a few like pregnant women who are going through pregnancy now and we talk, you know, back and forth once a week. And so it's really cool that I've gained a community as well. So Amazing. thank you for that. Good. <laughs> well, hey, yeah, not on me, but you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. I hope you got a lot from it. And thank you, Megan, for coming on. See you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>